Good afternoon. We have no one in the front row, but a full overflow room. <laughs> That's how you know we're a school of the church. <laughs> My name is Craig Barnes. I have the honor of serving as president of Princeton Seminary. And I want to welcome all of you for this important conversation on legacy and mission theological education, and the history of slavery. This conference is one of many events that we've held throughout the year to discuss the findings of the historical audit report and to discern faithful ways to maintain a community of faith and learning. The report itself is the result of more than two years of work by a committee of researchers. The report was intended to spark further research and conversation and one of the fruits is this conference. We're pleased to welcome scholars and practitioners from around the country to be with us and to enrich our conversation about this topic on campus. I'm especially grateful to Dr. Carrie Day and Dr. Gordon McCoskey, the faculty organizers of this event. They've done a superb job in designing the event, but have themselves made important contributions to our conversation. They were members of the original research committee and were among the authors of the report. They've also served on the task force that is developing recommendations of, to take to the Board of Trustees. I'm grateful to the entire task force for their diligent and faithful work this year to engage the participation of the seminary community, to listen to all responses that have been received, and to consider appropriate recommendations for the seminary to respond in a meaningful way to our history and its legacy. I'm particularly grateful to Dean John White, the very capable chair of this task force. Amen. And I'm grateful for the participation of the whole seminary community in our conversation. Thank you to those of you who've attended events, submitted responses, shared your ideas. We particularly embrace the participation of the Association of Black Seminarians. This has been a vibrant conversation, and it is a conversation that will be ongoing and will make our community stronger for having listened and learned from each other. But the conversation is not easy. It's difficult and painful to confront the truth about our past and what it means for the life of our community today. But truth-telling, confession, it's an important discipline for Christians. And confession should lead to making meaningful change or repentance. This is the reason we initiated this audit of our seminary's complicity with slavery several years ago. Our concern has always been not just what did we do, but what do we do today? Amen. And how has our legacy affected the way we think and act as a school? How can we do better than we have? What does repentance look like in substantial ways? So let us continue this work with courage and commitment and with grace. Amen. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to introduce our speakers for this afternoon in just a moment. But first, I want to begin by thanking President Barnes for establishing the context at Princeton Seminary where the slavery report could take place. He appointed the original task force to write the report, and he appointed the task force following up on that to figure out what we should recommend to the Board of Trustees to do in light of that, and um, provided the resources to make this conference possible. So I think we should give him a round of applause. So this conference is one part of a whole range of initiatives. Um, inspired by the PTS slavery audit and thinking about what we're going to do to be stronger and better and different. Uh, it uncovers narratives that were forgotten or suppressed from the 19th century, but also into the 20th century with an aim, as Dr. Barnes said, of telling the truth because truth is in order to goodness. You can't get to the good apart from telling the truth. Uh, at the deepest level, this is critical reflection on and creative construction of theological imagination of the reign of God and what a theological school is doing in relation to that imagination. Uh, my colleague, Professor Carrie Day, 
and I will take turns moderating the sessions. Uh, and in the final session, tomorrow, late tomorrow morning, we'll have uh, a chance for students to be part of a roundtable. We'll engage them. And also, uh, uh, Professor Braxton from the African American History Museum will be here to offer a few uh, reflections. And we'll share what we've heard and what we think it means. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, we are going to think in this session about higher education. Uh, this evening we'll hear about theological education for public witness. Tomorrow morning we'll hear about theological education for leadership in the church, all in relation to the slavery report and what, what it means, what people th uh, think it means, what we all think it means. Um, but we're going to focus in this session on listening to and learning from other institutions. We're not the first institution, obviously, to engage in a slavery audit. There are several others uh, who have done this before us. We may be one of the first theological institutions in the United States, uh, standalone church-related theological institutions to engage in this work. There are now others also doing this work. Uh, and so we're going to hear from colleagues who have been about this work in higher education. So in alphabetical order, I'm going to introduce uh, three distinguished guests and also a faculty respondent from our own faculty, uh, each of whom will have up to about 15 minutes, slightly longer, slightly less, depending, uh, and we'll hear what they have to say. And then uh, after the faculty respondent, then we'll give them a chance to engage each other, and then we'll open it up for a broader conversation. Um, <clears throat> so I want to begin with Jody Allen, who uh, is assistant professor of history and director of the Lemon Project at William & Mary. Uh, her research interests include the US Civil War through the Civil Rights Movement, focusing on African Americans. And her current manuscript, Roses in December, Black Life in Hanover County, Virginia during the Era of Disenfranchisement, studies the consequences of and responses to the 1902 Virginia Constitution revisions that disenfranchised many African American males. She's also working on a documentary film with a colleague, The Green Light, which looks at the school desegregation case, Charles C. Green versus the school board of New Kent County, Virginia. After Professor Allen, we will hear from Professor Adam Rothman, who comes to us from Georgetown University. He's the professor of history and director of the Georgetown Slavery Archive at Georgetown. And he teaches undergraduates and graduate courses in 19th century American history, the history of slavery, uh, Atlantic history uh, at Georgetown University. He was a member of the working group, group on slavery at Georgetown. And a memory, uh, he also worked on memory and reconciliation there as part of that effort. And so we'll be very interested to hear what he has to say about those questions. His first book, Slave Country, American Expansion and the Origins of the Deep South, traced the growth of slavery in the early United States, and his latest book, Beyond Freedom's Reach, A Kidnapping in the Twilight of Slavery, is the true story of three enslaved children taken from New Orleans to Cuba during the Civil War and their mother's effort to recover them. It's won awards from the American Civil War Museum, the American Liberty, or Library Association, rather, and the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. And rounding out the presentations by our distinguished guests is Martha Sandweiss, as we like to say, from across the street, uh, who is professor of history and director of the Princeton and Slavery Project at Princeton University. And many of you may have already been part of the university's slavery audit and the, or seen their website. They have done amazing work on all that, mainly because of what Professor Sandweiss has done with um, spearheading that project. She is professor of history at the university. She received her PhD in history from Yale University and began her career as a photography curator at the Ammon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, and then taught American Studies and History at Amherst for 20 years before coming to Princeton University in 2009. Uh, her publications include Passing Strange, A Gilded Age Tale of Love and Deception Across the Color Line, and um, Print the Legend, Photography in the American West. Um, so we're interested to hear what each of these three guests have to say about what they have learned from their institutions about doing slavery audits and going forward in light of the truths uncovered. And responding to them in a formal way will be our own Professor Mark Taylor, who
who is the Upson Professor of Theology and Culture here, and he frequently teachers, teaches and lectures in churches and supports church efforts to organize around issues of peace and justice. He earned his, union, uh, his MDiv at Union Seminary in Virginia and PhD from the University of Chicago, and his publications um, include The Executed God, The Way of the Cross in Lockdown America, and The Theological and the, and the Political on the Weight of the World. And we're very happy to have Professor Taylor providing some considered reflections on what we will hear now, beginning with Professor Allen. Okay. I've recently decided that I need to save paper. And so I'm going to use this thing that I've had for years and rarely use, so we'll see if it was a good decision or not. Um, good afternoon. Yes. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the committee for inviting me. It's always fun to talk about the Lemon Project. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to be a part of the continuing story, because this, never, this will never end, I don't think. Um, so the, the Lemon Project, a journey of reconciliation. Um, the origin story, at William and Mary there, well William and Mary is 326 years old. If anyone had really given it um, some thought, it's located in Virginia, um, they would have known before 2005 that enslaved people had been there. Um, <laughs> And I think what what had you know what had happened, of course, is that um, it was all of this stuff that we're finding in the archives did not magically appear. It's just that people who were in the archives, right, were going through, picking out, going over things. They they saw this list with these people's names on it. And, ah, we don't need that. Let's talk about President so and so, or let's talk about the fact that John Thomas Jefferson went here, or that George Washington got his surveyor's license here. But we're not going to talk about this list of unimportant people, and it might be a little embarrassing. So, um, but that information has been there all along. Um, so in, in in 2007, the state of Virginia uh, was celebrating or commemorating 400 years since the landing at Jamestown. And so the state issued uh, what they now call an apology, but what really is a statement of regret. They did not use the word apology. Um, and so that happened in 2007 where the state said, we, you know, we regret our role um, in slavery. That same year, um, a fairly activist um, chapter of the student chapter of the NAACP, along with the um, student assembly, which is William and Mary's student government, there was a student senator um, in that group who had taken some classes, who started to get, get an idea that, hey, you know, there's more to this institution than I knew about, you know, and, start, and so wanted to know more about slavery um, at William and Mary. And so it took um, that it, most of that in that school year, the 2007-2008 um, school year, but they passed a resolution calling on William and Mary to research its, its um, history as a slaveholder, make that research public, and to establish a memorial to the enslaved. And so that happened in, like I said, um, spring semester 2008. The next year, the faculty assembly passed a similar resolution. And then that following fall, they brought in a man named uh, Robert Ings, who was at that time a professor of history at Penn, but whose work centered around um, that particular area of Virginia. So they brought in an outsider to, uh, he, taught for a, he taught a course for a semester, and he worked with um, some graduate students and a committee that was set up to look into this question, you know, what, um, and, and one of the things they started at was to see, well, what has been happening so far? Has anyone done any research related to um, the history of slavery at William and Mary? And it just so happened there, there was a doctoral candidate at the time, um, Jennifer Ost, who was um, uh, working on her dissertation on institutional slavery, and she had done some research on William and, on William and Mary's history. And so she had actually come across this list 
in the bursar's records of enslaved people. Um, the the um, and Lemon's name was on that list. And so when it came time to name the project, the decision was this, uh, made to name it after Lemon because we knew um, the most about him, and it's very little. We knew that um, Lemon seemed to have act, acted at some t point as a vendor to the college. He sold, he was, a, he was apparently allowed to grow and he sold vegetables um, to the college. Um, we know that um, he was one of the people who received a what they called a Christmas bonus, um, which implies that you got something in the first place. But anyway, um, and then he, um, we know that they um, bought him medicine in 1815, um, 1816, and in 1817 um, they bought a coffin um, for lemon. And so as, as minute as that is, that we knew the most about him, but so Lemon has come to represent though all of the enslaved people known and unknown um, at the college. Um, and so the, Bob um, wrote a report to the um, Board of Visitors. And in, in that report, he talked about what had been found. He talked about um, the names that we had found, we had found um, by that point and called on the college to make an apology. Um, and so he presented that to the Board of Visitors. Um, and the Board of Visitors decided, I think it wasn't, it, they weren't ready to use the word apology. But the, they passed a resolution that acknowledged um, that William and Mary had owned slavery, uh, had owned slaves. Um, actually, William and Mary also owned a tobacco plantation um, that was used to um, provide financial aid for, as they say, less wealthy white males. And, but also, they actually took it farther and talked about looking at um, William and Mary's um, the, and the legacies of slavery. So it didn't just stop at um, slavery, but the legacy. So also looking at Jim Crow, of which the college um, was complicit. Um, and so they passed the resolution, you know, again, acknowledging and establishing the Lemon Project, which was supposed to be a um, long-term, and at that time, eight-year archival research project. And they um, hired me as a coordinator, and then they, they um, provided for a Lemon Fellow. So that first year, there were, there were two of us. And I remember we, uh, myself um, and the first fellow sitting in my office looking at each other because there was, there was no job description. Um, and so we, as academics will do, you know, we, we had a steering committee and we spent a good deal of time talking, you know, just talking through things and, but not really acting. And so Caroline and I went to the first um, uh, slavery in the university conference. It was at Emory um, University. And we drove down to Atlanta, and it was an amazing conference. And I don't know if it was, it was amazing, period, but it was also amazing because we were getting some answers. We were getting some ideas of, of steps we needed to take. And so we went back, and she and I decided, okay, enough talk. We're going to have a symposium. And so we, we, we started, um, we planned the, we had the first symposium, um, that was March of 2011, and we just had our ninth symposium um, a couple weeks ago. And so, but, bef and I got a little bit ahead. One of the things we did, we, uh, we, we felt like we could not go into the archives for eight years, probably do some amazing research, come out with some great articles, and then eight, eight years after it was announced and people would be going, what, what's that? What do you mean the Lemon Project? And so we thought we needed to work in the community at the same time. Amen. And so we did, um, we uh, started, well the symposium became, has become our biggest community outreach opportunity. Um, but we also um, did, you know, went to classes to talk and we went into the community to talk to share what we were finding as we were finding it. It slowed down to be honest with you some of the I think the archival research but we still were able to accomplish that 
um, but and, and, and there's still more to do. You know, and as a historian, you know, we always believe there's one box or one folder that hasn't been opened anyway. So, you know, this this magic answer is going to come, and you know, we're going to know everything. Um, but so so we we start planning, but we also start we we also look at the um, the resolution, and we decide, okay, what. How are we going to break this resolution down to make it make sense and support our work? And so we came up with three, uh, what we call a three-pronged approach. And the first was, of course, to do the initial um, the research, to, to go into the archives, because we needed to do that, but also to um, work on community engagement, to get out into the community, because part of the charge was to build of bridges between uh, William and Mary and the African American community. Because one of the things, I, I grew up in Hampton, which is about 30 minutes um, from Williamsburg. And I never went to school in Virginia until I decided to, to um, get my PhD and I um, applied to William and Mary. I made a conscious effort not to apply to William and Mary or UVA as an undergrad because of the stories I had heard about race at those at these institutions. So in 1995, when I applied, um, and of course, my parents decided to tell everybody in Hampton and Newport News that I had gotten into William and Mary. But one of the things that the messages that I kept getting back tell Jody that's great, but tell her to be careful. And so in 1995, and it's, it's, it's part of the cultural memory, you know, nothing happened to me that I, that, and nothing as far as I know happened to anyone in my family at William and Mary, but these stories are passed down from generation to generation. So that's, that was one of the things we were dealing with, the cultural memory. I still hear stories about guidance counselors who say to African American students, um, I don't know that William and Mary is gonna be the best place for you. You know, and so that's one of the things we're trying to, to overcome. So that was our, our second prong was to, like I said, to build a bridge between William and Mary and the African American community. Because again, I, and I didn't say, but of course, um, the, the Jim Crow era has left lots of memories. And so you hear people say, well, you know, I remember when you couldn't come on, if you were black, you couldn't come on William & Mary's campus unless you were pushing a broom. And it's true, they would get arrested if they came. Um, and, and an adult saw them. Now, as a, as a quick tangent, apparently it, the, the, the students would play with anybody who wanted to play a pickup game. Or, you know, and they would, you know, but then if an adult came into the gym, they would send the black kids out, you know. So, so, th so that's, um, that, you know, that was a, a a slight difference in terms of how the students felt. Um, the third prong is to current is to work with current students of color on campus um, to because there's still issues, um, certain departments more than than others, but um, to provide opportunities um, and programs to start new traditions at William and Mary um, that encompass everyone. Um, these a lot of William and Mary is full of traditions. I mean, in 300 over 300 years, of course, you know. But those traditions started when our most of our a lot of our current students. Oh my gosh, a lot of our current students could not. And I asked him to do this. Um, our current students could not, um, you know, would not have been able to participate. So, so that's um, that's where you know that's the the start of the program. So in three minutes, I'm going to tell you what we've been doing um, and what, uh, and we'll have more time to, to talk, but one of the things I think that William and Mary has certainly learned is that you can do this work and it's a good thing. There's nothing to be afraid of. You know, I think there's a fear that if, I, if we admit that we own slaves or if we admit that we um, participated in, in Jim Crow um, activities, then, you know, no one's going to come to our university, I guess. I don't know. But that's not the case. You know, I make it a habit of when I speak to folks to ask them, students in particular, if you had known this about William and Mary before you, you came, would you have decided um, to go somewhere else? And I've never had a student say yes to me. You know, many of them have said, 
well, I, I'm, I'm glad William & Mary is doing this. I'm glad I'm at a school that's, um, that is doing, that's taking this on. And so I think that's probably one of the biggest um, uh, things that are points that William & Mary has learned. Um, also, a year, about a year ago this month, William & Mary actually finally did an, um, uh, make an apology and use the word apology. Um, uh, Amen. Yes. I grew up Baptist. I love you. I grew up Baptist. Let's see. What else? Um, I think the, the other thing, I'm, I'm quickly going here, but I think the other thing is to fully commit. When you make this decision, fully commit to it. Provide the staff, provide the budget, provide the time. Um, if, if you have a faculty person who's going to be doing this, you know, release time. Because this is a lot of work. We did this a lot of years for just, with just two of us. This year, we finally have, I, I have um, an assistant. Um, I have a postdoc and two graduate students. I almost didn't know what to do with them in the beginning. Uh, but believe me, I figured it out. But, um, <laughs> So, you know, we, we have to fully commit, um, determine what it is you want to accomplish so that you know what you're working toward. Um, and one of the, the, the um, points I'm making, and I'll, I'll sit down um, and we can talk, um, is we, none of us, and this is something I say to my students, none of us today are responsible for anything that happened in the past. We could not control that. But what we are responsible for now is what we do with this information. Amen. When you know more, you do more. Yeah. You do better. And I think that's what we have to remember. We, there's no reason for anyone to feel guilty unless you know this information and you don't do anything about yeah. it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, President Barnes and the faculty conveners of uh, this conference. And I, I want to commend the authors of the historical audit um, for the seminary. Um, I read it uh, thoroughly, and I think it's a, a really remarkable piece of work. Um, having uh, been on a committee that authored a report like this, I know how, how much time and effort and energy and thought and reflection it takes um, to, um, to do the research, uh, to write a narrative that's cogent and powerful, and um, I think you have that. So I hope that everybody here and everybody in this community as a whole really reads, uh, reads that report and takes it seriously and learns from the history and absorbs that history. Uh, and just one more comment about that. Um, it is a, a, a really a searching analysis of the seminary's historical relationship to slavery. But I think perhaps the most important part of it is actually the analysis of the seminary's deep connection to the American Colonization Society and the way that the folks uh, at this place actually tried to wrestle not so much with the problem of slavery, but the problem of freedom. Uh, and I, I just think that is a, a, something we don't talk about quite, uh, quite enough, the way that people in the 19th century wrestled in some very problematic ways with the challenge of overthrowing slavery. And there's a lot to be learned from that history as well as the history of slavery itself. So there's a lot to chew on. Um, I come from Georgetown University, a university uh, whose history is deeply rooted in the history of slavery. And it's, uh, it's something else to be, a, to be a historian of slavery. That's my specialty at a university that owes its existence to the history of slavery. So I feel a special obligation to tell the story uh, to as many different uh, groups of people as possible. So let me start with the history. Georgetown was built on the, black, on the, on the backs of enslaved people. 
The founders of Georgetown College were the Catholic elite of Maryland and the new United States uh, coming out of the American Revolution. They were closely tied to um, the, the remnants of the Society of Jesus in Maryland, which at the moment of Georgetown's founding had actually been suppressed. But the Jesuits had been in Maryland from the 1630s. And by the early 18th century, they had become some of the biggest slave owners in the entire colony of Maryland, owning plantations, thousands of acres of land, and hundreds of enslaved people across the colony. So when Georgetown College was founded in, in the late 1780s, it was founded by a uh, a, a Catholic elite that really owed its wealth and power and prestige to slavery. And slavery was deeply woven into the life of the college from the very beginning. Not only did those plantations across Maryland, not only were they intended essentially to subsidize the education of free white men and boys at Georgetown, but uh, the campus was also a site of slave labor. Enslaved people worked at Georgetown. They were a, a substantial proportion of the community in the early years. So the history of the early history of Georgetown is deeply woven, interwoven with the history of slavery. But then something sort of interesting happens in the 1810s and 1820s. It turned out that the plantations that were run by the Jesuits, who were restored by the late 1810s, actually were turning out not to be profitable. So the Jesuits faced a problem of management at the same time as they confronted a rising anti-slavery movement. The Society of Jesus in Maryland spent 20 years debating what to do about their human property until finally in the 1830s, after a long debate, and there was a debate, uh, they decided, the leadership of the Jesuits decided basically to sell off the slave community. The person largely responsible for that decision and for executing uh, the sale was a man named Reverend Thomas Milady, who had been the president of Georgetown earlier in the 1830s, and at the time of the, the great Jesuit sale in 1838 was the head of the Maryland Jesuits. So in 1838, the leadership of the Maryland Jesuits, which was also the leadership of Georgetown College, sold nearly 300 enslaved men, women, and children to two planters in Louisiana. They sold them for $115,000, which is about $3 million in today's money. There was an initial down payment of $25,000 upon the execution of the sale in 1838, and the Jesuits turned around and loaned that money to the college to pull the college out of debt. So that is why I say that I might not be standing in front of you today as a professor at Georgetown, because there might not be a Georgetown if it had not been for this decision in 1838. But that was not the end of Georgetown's involvement with slavery. The, uh, the campus continued to be a site of slave labor all the way up until uh, the very eve of emancipation in Washington, D.C. in 1862. So there's a 150 year history that connects uh, Georgetown to, to slavery. Now, this history was not a secret. Scholars had been writing about this history, including Jesuit scholars, for 100 years before uh, the 21st century. So it was not a hidden history, but neither was it known. It was known to a small group of scholars and uh, some faculty and students at Georgetown who had been involved with the project connected to it in the 1990s, in the beginning of this century. But most people at Georgetown, most uh, American Catholics, most Americans, had no idea that any of this had happened. And that is why President, the president of Georgetown, Jack DeJoya, in the fall of 2015, launched a working group for slavery, memory, and reconciliation to try to, uh, he charged that working group with coming up with ways to acknowledge this history as a community. So I was a member of that working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation with uh, 15 uh, other faculty, staff, and students at Georgetown. 
And we worked for one academic year, 2015, 2016, to produce a report that would uh, introduce this story once again to our community and come up with some recommendations for how we as a community could, uh, could acknowledge this history. And let me just say that one of the provocations for forming this working group was that the university had just renovated a building on campus called Milady Hall, named after Reverend Milady, who was the chief architect of the sale. President DeJoya knew this history, and so I think he understood that this was an opportune moment to, to wrestle with our past. So the working group worked for one academic year. We held teach-ins and lectures and seminars. Uh, we brought the community in to discuss this history. Um, and ultimately, we, we uh, submitted a report to the president uh, in the spring of 2016. Over the course of the academic year, over the course of our proceedings, two important things happened that really shaped the way the university has responded to this history. One was student activism. Uh, students at Georgetown, undergraduate students at Georgetown felt like the working group was not working quickly enough to address some of the issues that they saw on campus. So in, the, in uh, November of 2015, they sat in in the president's office and uh, got, made certain things happen, including um, changing the name of um, Malady Hall and another hall named after another Jesuit who was involved with the sale. Uh, so st student activism really energized the community and I think raised the stakes of what we were trying to accomplish on the working group. The second thing that happened was uh, that uh, an alumnus uh, from Georgetown, Richard Cellini, uh, formed an organization called the Georgetown Memory Project, which took it upon itself to try to identify the living descendants of the people who the Jesuits sold in 1838. And by the late spring of 2016, members of that community had begun to emerge and there was a major article in the New York Times in April of 2016 uh, with the revelations of this emerging, what we call GU 272 descendant community. So that changed a lot of things. Um, and it drew our effort away from a kind of internally focused um, gaze at the university itself to uh, outside our walls. The working group's report made a number of recommendations, um, including uh, permanent, uh, permanent, uh, uh, permanent names for these two halls at, at Georgetown uh, that had been named after Jesuit priests, Mullady and McSherry. They are now named after, uh, in one case, a man named Isaac Hawkins who is the first person listed on the bill of sale uh, from the Jesuits to the purchasers in Louisiana. And another hall was, was named after Anne Marie Beecraft, who was a pioneering African-American nun who started a school for yeah. black children right outside of the gates of Georgetown uh, in the 1820s, so very early. The report also recommended uh, infusing Georgetown's curriculum with uh, information about our history. Uh, it uh, it advocated for research and teaching around this history. Uh, it um, advocated for different forms of commemoration and memorialization of this history. It advocated for further outreach to this emerging descendant community. And included in that was a specific recommendation that the children, uh, that, that descendants who applied to Georgetown uh, ought to be treated the same as the children of faculty, staff, and alumni, so colloquially known as giving them legacy status. And since then, I'm very proud to say that we now have enrolled at Georgetown several members, several students who are members of the descendant community. And their presence at, on campus, I think, has been very meaningful um, to everybody involved. Uh, for me personally, one of, the, one of the things that arose out of the activities of the working group was a, re, um, a, a realization that the work of scholars had really not been enough to teach uh, and educate the university community about this history. Like I said, scholars, a small group of scholars and students knew about it, but the broader community did not. So we've been trying to find ways to, to tell the story. Uh, to improve public access to this history. So I've been heavily involved with a project called the Georgetown Slavery Archive, a website, slaveryarchive.georgetown.edu, 
which has been digitizing archival material from Georgetown and other places connected to Georgetown and the Jesuit history of slavery, putting it online uh, for people to, to read, to digest, uh, to learn from, to teach with, um, to, um, and, and in many cases to use to research their own family histories. So now we have, this is an ongoing project. We started it more than three years ago. Uh, we now have more than 350 items on this archive. And it's been very useful, I think, for teachers. It's been educational for students. And it's been instrumental for those who have been researching their family histories going back to the GU 272. Um, great, thank you. Uh, and I'll say one more thing about that. Um, uh, you know, it's very difficult for many uh, African Americans to trace their family histories back uh, before 1870, back to the era of slavery for a whole variety of reasons, but basically linked to, to the suppression and denial of the, of the records of, uh, of, of human life and activity to enslaved people. So having this set of archives that document the presence of the Maryland Jesuit slave community for 150 years has really been a rich and extraordinary resource, not just for history, but the particular family histories of this group of people. And I've actually sat in the archives with members of the GU 272 community looking at the original archival material that contains the names of their ancestors. Amen. And it's a powerful thing. I mean, it's been powerful for me, and I think it's been meaningful um, for, the, for the descendants. And I, and I tell you, if you can understand how, um, uh, in this case, the Jesuits. So we, we, have, we have sacramental records uh, in which enslaved people are baptized, and we have sale records in which they're sold. And if you can understand how the Jesuits could baptize their slaves one day and sell them the next, then you understand the history of American slavery. Uh, so uh, just by way of conclusion, I think that um, all of these recommendations have uh, been, pr uh, have, have, you know, some of them have materialized, some of them have, been, have not. But I think they've also generated um, uh, expectations for more, for more kinds of engagement and for more uh, meaningful kinds of repair. Uh, as uh, the seminary here is a religious institution, Georgetown has a Catholic identity. The Jesuits, of course, are a religious order, and they have drawn on that heritage to try to uh, fashion meaningful forms of reconciliation. Two years ago, we had a set of events on campus, including a liturgy of contrition, hope, and remembrance with members of, of Georgetown, the Jesuit community, and the descendant community all coming together uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to start the process of reconciliation. With that event included um, uh, apologies apologies from the president of Georgetown and also the head of the North American Jesuits, who gave a very heartfelt apology where he named slavery as a sin that his order had been complicit with. Uh, so that's important. Um, in the last two years, there have been ongoing conversations and dialogues between members of the Georgetown administration, the Jesuits, and the descendant community to try to find a common way forward. Uh, and those talks uh, uh, have been prolonged and difficult, but they are taking place, and I think that's important. And finally, um, the, 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 the tradition of student activism lives on. This week, in fact, on Thursday, Georgetown undergraduates will be voting on a referendum to establish a student activity fee to raise funds to benefit the GU 272 descendant community. So kind of a self-imposed financial reparation for the university's uh, participation in this history. So they vote Thursday. We don't know which way they'll vote. Uh, we all await that vote with either trepidation or anticipation, depending on your perspective. But I think it is one of those creative responses that arises out of a meaningful wrestling with a difficult history. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here today because your story is our story. Um, I think my colleagues here at the Princeton Theological Seminary did a tremendous job on their investigation of their own institution's history with slavery, and their research contributes immensely to how we understand our experience at the university, and of course to how we understand how slavery worked in this town of Princeton where so many of us live, so thank you. The goal of our project at Princeton University is simply stated, the mission of the Princeton and Slavery Project is to thoroughly document the university's historical connections to the institution of slavery and to bring its research and public programming to the broadest possible audience to promote reflection and conversation. Our project began in the spring of 2013 and it launched publicly in November 2017. And you can find our findings uh, on our website, slavery.princeton.edu. What we learned is rich in detail and it, it intersects in so many ways with the story that's emerging from the seminary. It's rich in detail, but it's easily summarized. Princeton's early history exemplifies the central paradox of American history, writ small. Liberty and slavery were intimately intertwined. On our campus, which as all of you know is about half a mile from here, on our campus, which served as a battleground for George Washington's successful rout of British forces in 1777, on our campus, where the Continental Congress convened in Nassau Hall in 1783, Slavery was an integral part of the academic landscape. Princeton lore celebrates the fact that the sycamore trees in front of the president's house, the white frame house across from J. Crew, now known as McLean House, celebrates the fact that the trees there were set, planted to celebrate the repeal of the Stamp Act in the spring of 1766. But those history books do not note that after Samuel Finley, the fifth president of what was then called the College of New Jersey, died in July of that same year, his executors announced that they would sell his possessions, furniture, cattle, books, and two Negro women, a Negro man, and three Negro children. <coughs> those not sold beforehand would be auctioned off beneath the shade of those liberty trees. We learned that all seven of the college's founding trustees in 1746 were slaveholders, as were 11 of the 18 men who signed college charters over the next few years, Presbyterians all. We've learned that five of the six main donors and fundraisers for the construction of our campus in the mid-1750s were men who benefited from enslaved labor. We now know that the first nine presidents of, of our college were slaveholders at some point in their life. One actually came from Georgetown, so we need to talk about him. <laughs> and at least five of them lived with their human chattel on our campus. But we've also learned that the college as an institution never owns slaves. The enslaved people that we've documented belong to particular individuals. So unlike our colleagues, um, and, but, but unlike our colleagues, we will never be able to trace the descendants of those enslaved people who lived on our campus. Unlike you, we don't have surnames for any of them, save for one woman who had no children. Despite this, early Princeton students, all of whom lived and studied in Nassau Hall, which you all know, lived in what I would call a landscape of slavery. Behind Nassau Hall sat a farm that was worked by enslaved laborers. Enslaved laborers delivered wood to the college rooms. Enslaved people worked on Nassau Street. And enslaved people up until at least 1822 lived in the president's house, which for about half a century was the only other building on our campus besides Nassau Hall. We learned that we really were, as the old saying goes, the southernmost ivy. Because during the early Republic and antebellum eras, some 40% of our students came from the South. The comparable figures at Harvard and Yale are about 9 or 10%. At some moments, some 60% of our students came from the South. And there are multiple consequences of this. One consequence, the violence that erupted in this town in the 1830s and 40s as students from slaveholding families encountered free people of color who lived in the town of Princeton. A more far-reaching one, 
the evolution of a conservative political ethos on our campus during the antebellum period. As the administration struggled to make the school a place that remained accommodating to Southern students and Northern students alike, as sectional tensions threatened to rip our country apart. I would cite as an example of that conservative political ethos, our engagement with the American Colonization Society too. We share that story. Your founders were Princeton men by and large. Our president was the president of the New Jersey uh, ACS. Our project began not as a fully conceived project, not as a project mandated by the administration, as has been the case here at PTS, but as a one-off undergraduate history seminar in the university archives in the spring of 1913. I'd arrived at Princeton just a few years before and was surprised to learn that nobody was working on this. I was curious, and honestly, I was so ignorant. Um, what would we find if we dug into the archives? The project has grown beyond anything I could have imagined in the beginning, and our research on that website now includes the work of some 40 contributors, including one who's on your faculty, a thousand pages of text, and more than 300 digitized primary source documents, along with maps, videos, films, and lesson plans. But what I want to turn to now is the very bottom-up nature of our study, and what it was really the absence of an institutional mandate for the work that we did. I wanted to be transparent about this work, so I approached uh, the central administration of our university, the including the president. I wanted them to know what we were doing, to understand that this was simply a serious research project, we weren't out to embarrass the university, and we had no political agenda. I sought their outright support, I really did, and I also sought their financial help. Um, because I do think these sorts of institutional projects have a greater power when they have that sort of moral imprimatur of the school itself. But the university president offered me a different kind of support. He encouraged me, absolutely, to pursue the project. But he declined to support it in a direct way. His feeling was that a faculty-led project is always stronger when it's freed from administrative concerns or priorities. I'll be honest, I was a little disappointed with that. Um, but over time, I've come to realize that our particular and peculiar modus operandi actually had some benefits. Um, although, as I scrambled to raise money from one source or another, I rarely had that perspective. <laughs> the key point I want to make is that we had enormous freedom to design our research study, to construct a timeline for its execution, and to partner with all the other entities in town who collaborated with us, the McCarter Theater, the Public Schools, the Art Museum, the uh, Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood. For better or worse, decision making was very centralized in our project. The core project team, and at any one time, a part-time postdoc, and sometimes a part-time graduate student. But we had a lot of teammates. Our researchers were our students, both undergrads doing work in conjunction with classes and grad students working on their own for the sheer pleasure of being part of a big public history project. We also uh, enjoyed the support of a number of professional colleagues who kindly agreed to support their research with us and to contribute material to our website. Later, we brought in website developers and designers, and throughout, really, we relied on the kindness of friends, particularly our colleagues uh, at the Mudd Library, the University Archives at Princeton. In the end, we were happily able to raise funds on campus, chiefly from the University Humanities Council, and we're just so grateful to them. In not being part of a centrally mandated project, we not only retained a certain kind of intellectual freedom, we retained the nimbleness to present our work however we liked. The website, the arts, a documentary film. Um, and we can make decisions quickly. You can't imagine how great it was to do this project without having to go to meetings. Mm. <laughs> um, and I, but that's a serious point, because there is an elaborate decision-making process that, that educational institutions necessarily engage in. For better or worse, we were outside of it. The key point to make about our independence, however, is that we were never charged with being reflective, never charged with coming up for suggestions for how the university should respond 
never charged with describing or suggesting what should come next. It was not in our wheelhouse. That was not my charge. As Adam just said, it was way above my pay level. Our website, with its thousand pages of text, contains not a single suggestion for what the university should do. In our project, the historical research was entirely separated from any pressing contemporary debates about diversity, reparative justice, or moral obligation. Now, I don't pretend that history is a neutral discipline. Of course it's not. Historians have values and concerns shaped by their present day surroundings. But again, our study includes no explicit advice or framework of values for moving forward. As a faculty member, as an individual faculty member, I simply didn't have the standing to do that. It, was, it's not, it isn't my job. It's appropriately not my job. As we plotted the formal rollout of our project, the university had no clearly formed plan of response. Nonetheless, some excellent programs have arisen in the past few years, and I would say they have been spurred by our project, but they're not directly a response to it. The university, for example, now has something called the Histories Fund, which invites proposals from university members to investigate any overlooked aspect of the institution's history. There is a naming committee, which is considering new names for spaces on campus. There are new historical walking tours. But each of these programs presents the slavery story as just one of many overlooked stories from Princeton University's past. None of these new initiatives particularly addresses head on some of the issues that might be more specific to our institutional history with slavery. Issues involving reparations or the redress of lost opportunities or the dilemmas of morally tainted money. None of them addresses head on the responsibilities a 21st century, first century institution might have to those affected by the sins of its 18th and early 19th century incarnations. But each is an excellent program in the, to the extent that it encourages university members to look beyond some of the old lore about Princeton and to construct a past that makes a place for a better and more diverse present and future. In terms of things directly addressing the findings of our research, there will soon be installed a new plaque in front of McLean House, in front of the President's House, that will list the name of every known enslaved person who lived there. But it's tied up in meetings. I, I can't tell you exactly when it's going to go up. Um, every, every institution has to find its own way forward in the face of newly uncovered knowledge about its past. And I really think there's a lot to admire about the theological seminary strategy in which a reckoning with the moral consequences of the past has been conceived as part and parcel of the historical work. As issues arise here, they can be dealt with thoughtfully with an agreed upon, within an agreed upon framework of values and institutional priorities. In our case, across the street or whatever you say, quite frankly, the response has been more ad hoc. And as student or alumni questions continue to arise, it would, in my opinion, be useful to have a firmer institutional framework to guide responses. I don't think there is a one-way, one fits-all way to structure these studies. In our case, the absolute separation between historical research and policy making has, I think, actually made things more challenging for the administration. Even if for a long time I thought it only made things more challenging for me. In the end, I understand that that separation gave us, my colleagues and I, the freedom to do the research we wanted to do. The administration, though, does not have that ready-made framework for moving forward. In the end, I think they suffered more from their approach to this project than we did. And I think it may be, in the end, in part that, that that separation that has contributed to the widespread acceptance of our work within the broader Princeton University community. Our deep historical invest, investigation comes to our vast alumni community without an agenda. And I think actually that has made it easier for many people to swallow. Thank you so much. Colleagues are distributing a handout that I have of my remarks because I'm sure I'm not going to get through everything I have here. 
Um, and uh, I want to begin first with a word of thanks to the Audit Task Force, Histori History of Slavery Task Force uh, here at the seminary. I've learned so much. And thanks to then for our colleagues that have come from other institutions to uh, allow us to learn from them. After hearing from them and looking at their notes, I was driven to go back and reread our own audit. And then I found myself going to a website, a consortium of uh, universities studying slavery. And the more I went back and forth and then into the literature I knew about the anti-slavery movement and abolitionist struggle, I found myself wanting to experiment with the title for my response remarks, which I'll try to keep close to the respondents because I have, have learned much. A title that is this, Universities Studying Slavery as Abolitionist Struggle, question mark. Now, being a respondent to these uh, remarks by these distinguished historians is a daunting task, not only because the material is, is complicated, but because uh, history is not my field, and I recognize even more how important the historical disciplines are to getting at this material. All the universities studying slavery are involved in what will be a long process. Indeed, perhaps like Dr. Allen said, it won't end. Every institutional study of its legacy seems, to various degrees, to go deep, spark intricate controversy, even as it spins uh, webs like nets that dredge up more than we thought we knew uh, or thought was down there or back there. The overall point of my remarks that I want to keep before you is that all this institutional work might helpfully be seen as itself part of abolitionist struggle. As such, our formation of the current institutional work we're doing needs to be as broad and at points as revolutionary as was abolition. I want to experiment with that. But another prefatory word. None of us, especially in higher education, theological or otherwise, is free from entanglement in the web that slavery and white supremacy have spun. None are free from embeddedness in the material and symbolic structural legacy of slavery's multitudinous national and international apparatus. Certainly not this way respondent. I won't go into this in depth, but a few quick facts will make my point. I've been 37 years at Princeton Seminary, four years a PhD at the Rockefellers funded U Chicago, three years preceding that a seminary student at Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy, complete with monuments down the streets. I could trace for you, uh, but won't in the interest of time, my paternal line of descent, my maternal line of descent, and find my own imbrication in the history of slavery and the apparatus of power stemming from it in this nation. I recall a faculty colleague uh, saying at a discussion at uh, the president's house once that maybe we need to look at our faculties and administrations, family invocations in the history of slavery. Uh, and I wonder if my colleagues um, have found that kind of discussion at all helpful at their institutions. It made me recall something that Antonio Gramsci famously said when he indicated that a starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is and knowing thyself as a product of the historical process to date, which is deposited in you an infinity of traces, but without leaving an inventory. Therefore, it is imperative at the outset to compile such an inventory. We have scholars doing that inventory, but what would it mean to do a critical self-inventory in terms of Grim, uh, Gramsci's words? So on truth-telling and reconciliation, it can't be missed here that in all these reports, and I could see this too when I went online to the consortium, that there's a certain rhythm in the reports. Uh, you list the matters that truth needs to be told about, the hard truths, the wrongs done, among key figures and institutions. You've heard them from uh, the presenters. I won't summarize them. Uh, they are important. They're clear that they are wrongs. 
There's one not mentioned in our reports, and I don't think it's mentioned in the Princeton Seminary report that is included in Rutgers' uh, slavery uh, reports, the one uh, entitled The Scarlet and the Black, where they begin by reflecting on the land that was taken from the Leni Lenape peoples and then became land that was worked by the slaves. And I'm wondering how we build that remembrance into our reflections uh, as well. Then in addition to the various themes of truth-telling, the other side of the rhythm, uh, the two-step as it were, is um, various modes of steps towards reconciliation. These varied from uh, calling it a sin. Uh, the truth-telling itself was seen as a kind of regressive act. Uh, it can be a good work in itself, uh, said Dr. Allen in her remarks. Various forms of memorializing, listing names, uh, uh, remembering the slave named Lemon at William and Mary, for example, establishing the slavery archives as so many of these institutions have done, walking tours to create greater consciousness, fellowships offered as at Georgetown or some aid towards such um, and called for uh, by the reparations document of the Association of Black Seminarians at Princeton Seminary in part stimulated by this report. Uh, there's building renaming processes also. All of these are the various compensatory acts that one finds in the report. There's also, I think, a search for exemplars. Uh, at least that was clear in the seminary report with the turn especially to the likes of Theodore Wright, which Princeton University writes about at great helpful length, I thought, too. But also, uh, who is a Wright was an abolitionist, a pastor, a graduate of our seminary, a, pa a pastor of the uh, large church in New York City. Elijah Lovejoy was a martyr, uh, evangelical pastor and publisher who lost his life to a mob that did not approve of his absolute ab abolitionist writings. So with that exemplar uh, work especially, I found myself reflecting on the fact that there might be two certainly overlapping but distinguishable paradigms for thinking about slavery's historical influence coming down into our present and then setting the stage for different ways of, of asking the what to do question. So I want to distinguish uh, two paradigms for understanding slavery's historical influence. The first is the one that we have already seen here, um, exemplified in many ways, what I'll call a reconciliatory transaction paradigm. Um, here again, you reveal the wrongs, the great crimes, the masses of victims, the enslaved, and then we consider various transactions we might make or steps or moves we might make, apology, reparations, and so on, as a meaningful exchange interaction that enables to reconstitute our communal bonds, uh, certainly around an ideal um, of, uh, of justice. Um, um, there can be monetary provisioning, again, as called for by the ABS reparations and other institutions. Since I'm about to propose a second paradigm for thinking about all this, I want to make sure that I'm not heard as proposing that my second paradigm replace the first one to supplant it like it wasn't necessary. I believe it is. Uh, Truth-telling and reconciliatory steps. I signed the document in support of reparations. I do hope we move towards apology. So this is very important work. But the second paradigm I call one of abolition struggle, an abolition struggle paradigm. Here the great suffering and injustice of slavery is still recognized and so also is a contemporary need to make the wrongs right and so forth. But however, alongside the history of that victimization in history, there is also a history of enslaved people's fight back, their resistance to it, their will to end it, an abolitionist reflex, we might say, that inaugurates and always is part of abolitionist advocacy, organizing, and movement. Uh, these works by uh, our colleagues up here and some of the others uh, drove me to go more deeply into a book uh, suggested by my colleague uh, a few months ago, uh, John Boland, The Slaves Cause, A History of Abolition. And I spent a lot of time working on that, and uh, my historian colleagues will have to forgive me if I spend all too much time in, in that book. But um, Professor Sinha in that book points out that slave resistance, not bourgeois liberalism or paternalism, lay at the heart of the abolition movement. 
Sinha writes, the enslaved inspired the formation of the first Quaker-dominated abolition and manumission societies, as well as the first landmark cases that inaugurated emancipation in the Western world. This is a theme all the way through her text that is important to acknowledge, that abolition movements, which, is, which were interracial movements, and strikingly so, and national, were inspired by slave resistance. And at crucial points, they were re-empowered by slaves resistance. So I think there are two important consequences of this second paradigm and the way it might help us. First, I think our institutional work of truth telling and reconciliation can be seen as belonging to the historical struggle of the enslaved for their own abolition. This might chasten any tendency to congratulate ourselves for turning with new sensitivity to the, the history of slavery and making reparations and remind us that we owe a debt to the enslaved and their ancestors who never stopped struggling, Amen. who were part of an abolition struggle Amen. and thereby kept the heat on us even though we could often choose to not feel the heat and not act in accord uh, with it. There are many examples of that, and I experiment with the idea that one can see the kind of archival explorations that we've been doing here and our colleagues have been doing so well. This archival exploration as a response to the local memories that have uh, presented us with, in Foucault's words, and I won't go too heavy into Foucault, an insurrection of subjugated knowledges <laughs> that have been buried or disqualified but which student resistance and action often, again, from the enslaved ancestors themselves, have given us motivation and inspiration to go find so that we unbury, we reverse disqualifications. Um, it was, in fact, the essence of Foucault's notion of genealogy, the genealogy that uh, you combine scholarly erudition with the local memories, the cries, and the work, and the pressure. And it seems to me that that's what we have in example of here, uh, and I just want to say, couldn't this be viewed as part of abolitionist struggle, the outcome of slave resistance, okay? Um, then um, um, the other point I want to make, the other consequence is that I think our institutional work towards reconciliation would point beyond reformism toward a revolutionary work, a more revolutionary work that is as broad and variegated as was the abolition struggle and vision. Uh, reading Sinha or other the abolitionists, I was reminded again that this was not just a race struggle. There were not just race men who were abolitionists or race women. I mean, this was foremost, yes, fighting white supremacy uh, and, or white normativity as our PhD, excuse me, our, our Princeton Seminary document writes of it. It was much more um, uh, comprehensive as seen her writes. The black abolitionists especially were quintessential outsiders questioning the very foundations of the early American Republic. Black abolitionists were not so much black founders as they were the founding critics of what? The country, Amen. the whole nation. Uh, and she cites some other writings, uh, interestingly, in the William and Mary Quarterly. This should not be surprising because slavery itself, which was being resisted, was not just a race thing. It was that, to be sure, but it was so much more, and abolitionists knew that. Um, perhaps Sven Beckert, uh, another historian who I've learned some in his Empire of Cotton uh, book, reminds us of this when he wrote, slavery stood at the center of the most dynamic and far-reaching production complex in human history. He cites uh, British mercantilists who themselves were aware of this. And coercion was the necessary condition for making that global economy work. Many other scholars today are making the links with great controversy in historical literature, I know, between uh, slavery and the, um, and the rise of capitalism and, and, and global markets. Uh, slavery was about captivity for labor and profit. And because this was the case, its legacy today is especially evident in the way captivity and profit are linked together in the building and sustenance of our nation. This is why I think it's right, those who link not only mass incarceration, our system of imprisonment today, to the history and legacy of slavery, 
but link also the very nature of our carceral state to uh, the legacy of slavery. Slavery produced something of a rogue nation that performs both on the national stage and the world stage with war, with new modes of captivity for profit, and these need to be addressed as part of address and redress of slavery. Sinha's text is full of examples of the international consciousness of the early black abolitionists, the way they were conscious of the need to fight capitalism in their day, to make some kind of common cause with socialists. Um, and so they knew the international stage. And I think this means, and with this I'll close, uh, I have much more on this than I can present, but you see where I'm going. It means that while we make the reparations within the reconciliatory transactional paradigm, we can see the larger struggle of, as an abolitionist struggle that takes us in struggle with our nation, not just making recompense to those within which we should do, please don't forget that. But um, the, the best reparations documents and reparations have been going on for a long time, right, by NCOBRA and by the Black Radical Congress. They have programmatic elements that target the nation Amen. and are not just within the, the realm of the institution. And that's what I'm pointing myself to. And I know it makes the problem even bigger. For example, it means we have to look at other regimes of subjugating knowledge, not just white supremacy, but Christian supremacy. They were all Presbyterians, said one of our speakers. I mean, they could not envision or respect uh, other religions, even if there were Jews in the colonial period, even Muslims or those influenced by Islam among the slaves, and certainly not the many indigenous spiritualities of, uh, of this period. Christian supremacy, but also capitalist um, exploitation of land and labor. The anti-capitalist dimension of the famous abolitionist uh, Garrison has, uh, has been underestimated and uh, needs to be explored, as well as the way uh, black abolitionists raise question about the, the lords of, uh, of, the, of the loom and their controlling of, of, of capital. U.S. imperial nationalism. Uh, Manisha Sinha points out how the, um, this is another subjugating regime targeted by the abolitionists. Uh, they knew the rise of the empire that was being done on their bloodied backs, and they called it out, and they named it. What would it mean for us to oppose slavery by opposing a nation that still makes war and has the kind of control of weaponry and exports it to other countries and causes great suffering in the places like Yemen, uh, in Palestine, under our ally Israel, Israeli state, what would it mean to question that as well? And then finally, uh, Sinha points out that a certain hegemonic masculinism, uh, kind of masculinist domination, was also uh, targeted by the abolitionists. In fact, women uh, seeking to break free from certain modes of, uh, of domination were the foot soldiers, she says, of abolition. And the, the fight for the freedom of women was intrinsically bound up, right, with the fight against slavery that abolitionists waged. Well, I'm simply suggesting that with this change in paradigm, um, we have a, a broader focus as well as a way to reread what we're doing as an acknowledgement of the insurrection of the enslaved breaking forth into our own time and places. Thank you. Thanks to all. Uh, we, we have some time first to have the panelists, uh, the presenters, and the respondent to interact around some of the issues that have been raised. And then we want to open it up so that there's uh, ample time for people to pose questions or to express things for the, to inter engage with our presenters. So first, uh, you all have microphones there. And uh, I just want to um, invite you to respond. Maybe I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, what, Professor Taylor just ended with reminds me of, um, as I was reading a history of a biography of William Lloyd Garrison, there was a mention made of Reverend John Rankin, a non-Princeton Presbyterian minister from East Tennessee, who wrote a series of letters to his brother um, arguing against slavery. 
And uh, William Lloyd Garrison said these letters were what inspired him to join the abolitionist cause. And he diagnosed the deepest roots of slavery and racism is capitalistic greed from 1830-something. And uh, it just kind of struck a chord um, that Reverend Rankin, the non-Princeton <laughs> Presbyterian, may be onto something there. Um, <laughs> But I wonder maybe if you want to pick up on what Professor Taylor was putting on the table of the deepest roots, maybe, of slavery and racism in the American context. Um, well, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, well, this is one of the things you made me think about was um, Thomas Roger Dew who was a president of a pro-slavery um, ideologue and became president of William and Mary in 1836. And, but he, he became famous and William and Mary became famous uh, for his pro-slavery uh, pro ideology after Nat Turner's rebellion. And because of Virginia, the whites in Virginia, and I think throughout the South were scared to death because of, after Nat Turner. Um, and the Virginia General Assembly uh, decided, reluctantly, but decided that it was going to hold these debates about what to do about slavery. Um, because you had, they had this population in, just in Virginia of almost half a million people, and there was a real fear that they were going to all uh, rebel and, and kill all of the white people. And so they, they debated for 13 days, but they couldn't figure out how to end slavery. They didn't have the money to end slavery. Um, and because of property rights, um, if they were going to free these people, then they would have to pay the owners um, for their loss of property. And so they, they, couldn't, they couldn't do it. And so they, um, the debates ended um, with this, the status quo in mind and then do uh, who at that time was a, a pres uh, professor of history, wrote this um, dues reviews on the De Virginia debates of 1831 and 1832. And basically he um, tried, he, he gave the scholarly support for what the, the General Assembly had already decided to do. And he, he spoke to the fact that um, it was, uh, they, they were, first of all, they should have never had the debates um, in the first place. There was no need for them to do it. And there was some reasons um, for that. One, he said that blacks would never be able to organize um, and to uh, rebel against the entire state of Virginia. Um, and that the, um, uh, let me think, because I'm just, not, um, what was the other? Um, anyway, he said that the, the, the key point that he made was that there were almost 470,000, there were 400, according to the 1830 census, there were almost 470,000 enslaved people, valuing them at a roughly $200 a piece, that would be $94 million, which was a third of the state's um, financial backing. So because of money, they could not, um, he felt uh, in slavery. And he also spoke to the people who were concerned about the um, Christian, the, the, the anti-Christian uh, ideas of, behind slavery. And he said, no, that's not a problem either because um, God has said that if, if, two, if t both sides are going to be um, harmed. If, so whites would be harmed and so would blacks because blacks needed whites to keep them enslaved to civilize them. And so because there was this mutual need, God would not step in. So they did not have to fear the wrath of, the wrath of God. Um, he also said, though, that the reason Virginia had slavery in the first place was because the English had brought them. And so the English was really responsible because they brought blacks to Virginia during the colonial period. And again, God would not hold Virginians responsible for something the English had done. And now, of course, he did not talk about all the other, you know, leftovers of the British that they had managed to get rid of. Um, <laughs> 
but not not slavery. But again, what seems to have been um, the key factor was the financial factor that they could not take people's property and they could not run that state and therefore and really the south without these enslaved people so indeed capitalism was um, a major argument although he never used he never used that term of course but that you know again that the uh, financial um, issues um, supported by christianity was how they were able to sleep at night i guess so the, this conversation is, is making me think of something. That is, maybe we need to have a conversation about scale. That is, we can talk about how slavery operated within our institutions or within the Jesuit community or perhaps within the larger Presbyterian community or our town. But states matter too. Colonies and states matter too. And I have a question for all of you. Does anybody know when slavery was abolished in New Jersey? 1804, Tech technically. Technically, never. New Jersey failed to ratify the 13th Amendment. Um, and if, uh, frankly, if there's a student in this, in this room who's looking for an interesting project, perhaps you could see whether it was ever symbolically approved by the state of New Jersey, because that's, that would be a, a really interesting project for us um, to embark on. But I think in your conversations, Mark, you're, 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 you're talking about a very large way of thinking about reparations. and. I, I don't know how we sort of adjust the scale of our thinking as we begin to think what can we actually affect, what can we do, and where can we have an impact. Shall I respond yeah, to yeah. that before we yeah, 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 please. Yeah, I like that question. In fact, I struggled with that. I was saying to myself when putting together these remarks, I'm just making it too big. <laughs> but that being said, uh, and I, while I feel your question, I also do believe, and I think some of the the, uh, the black and white abolitionists I've read about, but I know in the present, there are ways of structuring local projects to fight white supremacy or any of these other subjugating regimes in such a way that you take account of the different, the di the different uh, scales that, that we're looking at. And that's what I was, uh, was, was pressing for, not that we just go big and forget the local um, or, or, the re or the reverse. And it also means that I appreciated the point about uh, Garrison and, and Deepest Roots, but I wasn't pressing for any one of these um, subjugating regimes to made, be made the root of it all. Uh, I, but I, I, I was pressing that we not leave out any of the dimensions that seem to be operative. Capitalism very prominently in the do material, which doesn't make capitalism more deeply problematic than white supremacy uh, or US imperial expansionism and all the rest that, that we, you know, the somewhat popular language of intersectionality now in the academy is something that I think we should think about here. But uh, there, the abolitionists represented a coalition of, of activists in struggle here that I think needs to be acknowledged. So I'll stop there so we can keep talking with others. Professor Rothman, you want yeah, to join in? Sure, I'll just say um, one thing. I'm, I, I'm uh, really quite deeply moved by Mark's comments about seeing um, the university's studying slavery project as part of a contemporary abolitionist struggle that can learn a lot from the original abolitionists. And just to add to that point, um, I think it's useful to clarify the distinction between the radical abolitionists of the early 19th century and the colonizationists uh, who are so prominent here. Because actually both of these groups, to you know, when the colonizationists more or less, um, the co were opposed to slavery. The American Colonization Society, at least Finley and in, in his circle, they actually imagined this as a way to get rid of slavery. Mm -hmm. So that the American colonization side, they're trying to basically kill three birds with one stone. They're trying to abolish slavery, remove all the black people, and Christianize Africa mm -hmm. all at once. That's what, they're, that's what they're doing. That's what they're trying to do, okay? Uh, you could look at them, so they are, but they're, they're anti-slavery. They see slavery as an evil. 
uh, to be eradicated. And this is, th this is the way they, they want to go about doing it. But actually, what are they? And um, in, in the aspiration to remove black people from the United States, they are white nationalists. They are white nationalists, OK? The abolitionists are not. The thing that really distinguishes the abolitionists from the colonizationists is that the abolitionists could imagine free black Americans as actually as citizens. Amen. All right, so that's, and and the, the abolitionist movement, both the black abolitionists of the 1820s and then the Garrisonian abolitionists of the 1830s that are inspired by the black abolition of the 1820s, they actually arise as a critique of colonization. That's how they cut their teeth, you know? Um, and the black abolitionists, uh, in alliance with the Garrisonians, actually actually articulate a vision of black citizenship. David Walker says, this is our country as much as it is the whites, but we watered it with our blood and tears. So to, I think to understand, um, understand this work, per, perhaps as um, carrying on the legacy of abolitionism, we can understand it as a fight against, a contemporary fight against white nationalism in its, all its forms. And to imagine um, us as, as seeking um, a, um, a nation of um, diverse and equal people. <laughs>